In this video, we're going to go through a free GED Reasoning Through Language Arts RLA practice test for the multiple choice section. And I made these questions myself and I, I wrote them to be similar to the types of questions you'll see on the real test, with the exception being that the passages are going to be shorter in this YouTube video for the sake of time. Now this is the second GED RLA practice test I've made here on this channel. If you missed part one, you might want to check it out down below after this video, but it's not necessary to have seen that to still benefit from this video. So let's get started. On a hill by the Mississippi, where the Chippewas camped two generations ago, a girl stood in relief against the cornflower blue of northern sky. She saw no Indians now. She saw flour mills and the blinking windows of skyscrapers in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Nor was she thinking of squaws and portages and the Yankee fur traders whose shadows were all about her. She was meditating upon walnut fudge, the plays of Bria, the reasons why heels run over, and the fact that the chemistry instructor had stared at her new coiffure, which concealed her ears. A breeze which had crossed a thousand miles of wheatlands bellied her to feta skirt, in a line so graceful, so full of animation and moving beauty, that the heart of a chance watcher on the lower road tightened to wistfulness over her quality of suspended freedom. She lifted her arms. She leaned back against the wind. Her skirt dipped and flared. A lock blew wild. A girl on a hilltop. Credulous. Plastic. Young. Drinking the air as she longed to drink life. The eternal aching comedy of expectant youth. It is Carol Milford, fleeing for an hour from Baudette College. The days of pioneering, of lassies and sunbonnets, and bears killed with axes and piney clearings, are deader now than Camelot. And a rebellious girl is the spirit of that bewildered empire called the American Middle West. Question 1. Which of the following is the best summary of the first and second paragraphs? Carol misses the days when fur traders roam the area. B. Carol has difficulty getting along with other students at her college. C. The setting of the story has changed a lot from how it once was. Or D. Carol dreams of leaving the Middle West and moving to the East. So pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Process of elimination is always a good strategy to use on the GED whenever you can. And here we can eliminate B and D right away um, because neither of these things came up in the passage. Now we're left with A and C. And so if we look at the text again here, it says that the Chippewas camped two generations ago. And it goes on to say that she saw no Indians now. Now, of course, today we would say Native Americans rather than Indians, but this is an older text, so the author says Indians here. But she doesn't see them anymore, and it also, it doesn't say that she misses the days of the fur traders. In fact, it says that she's not even thinking about them. So, the answer here is C. Okay, question two reads, the word kofir in paragraph three most likely means which of the following? And I have the paragraph here if you'd like to read this for yourself. Then you have the answer choices, A, a type of shoe, B, a place along the Mississippi River, C, a type of hairstyle, and D, a type of necklace. So whenever I can, when I make, make up these practice tests, I try to give you the snippets from the paragraph uh, so it's easier than having to rewind the video or look back. So here you see that I gave you the text from paragraph three. I don't always do this because I can't always fit it on the screen, but here I gave it to you. So go ahead and pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. So basically, to figure this out, you just have to reason your way through this. And again, process of elimination is always helpful here. And the clue in the text, the main clue is that the kofir is, I think I'm pronouncing that right, but it's concealing her ears. Now, a shoe is not going to conceal her ears. And it's clearly, hopefully you see it's not talking about a place along the Mississippi River. It's talking about a thing that can conceal her ears. Now, a necklace... I guess a very unconventional necklace could conceal the ears, but we're looking for what whatever the word kofir most likely means. And most likely, a necklace is probably not going to conceal the ears. So that leaves us with C, a type of hairstyle, which is the correct answer. Okay, on to the third question here. So question three reads, which of the following would Carol most likely agree with? A, rules were made to be broken. 
B. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Or C. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Or D. Treat others how you would want to be treated. So you know the drill by now. Pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, let's go over this here. So the answer here is A. Rules were made to be broken. And the clue for this comes in the text where it reads, And a rebellious girl is the spirit of that bewildered empire called the American Middle West. So it's that word rebellious, and it says rebellious girl, so it's talking about Carol. And that's why we know that A is most likely what Carol would agree with. Okay, so now we're moving on to a new passage. And the passage reads, starting at section 1, the sunlight dripped over the house like golden paint over an art jar, and the freckling shadows here and there only intensified the rigor of the bath of light. The Butterworth and Larkin houses flanking were entrenched behind great stodgy trees. Only the Happer house took the full sun, and all day long faced the dusty road street with a tolerant, kindly patience. This was the city of Tarleton, in southernmost Georgia, September afternoon. Up in her bedroom window, Sally Carol Happer rested her 19-year-old chin on a 52-year-old sill and watched Clark Darrow's ancient Ford turn the corner. The car was hot. Being partly metallic, it retained all the heat it absorbed or evolved, and Clark Darrow, sitting bolt upright at the wheel, wore a pained, strained expression as though he considered himself a spare part and rather likely to break. He labor lab laboriously crossed two dust ruts, the wheels squeaking indignantly at the encounter, and then with a terrifying expression, he gave the steering gear a final wrench and deposited self and car approximately in front of the Happer steps. There was a plaintive hearing sound, a death rattle followed by a short silence, and then the air was rent by a startling whistle. Sally Carroll gazed down sleepily. She started to yawn, but finding this quite impossible, unless she raised her chin from the windowsill, changed her mind, and continued silently to regard the car, whose owner sat brilliantly, if perfunctorily, at attention, as he waited for an answer to his signal. After a moment, the whistle once more split the dusty air. Now just a heads up here, section 7 through 12, the author wrote this based off of his idea of a southern voice here, um, and so... I'm originally from the Northeast, so please don't laugh at me too hard for trying to, to read this in a Southern voice here. But it goes, Good morning. With difficulty, Clark twisted his tall body round and bent a distorted glance on the window. It's wait, it, it, wait morning, Sally Carroll. Isn't it sure enough? What you doing? Eating an apple. Come on, go swimming. Want to? So question four says, which of the following is most likely true about the house Sally lives in, based on the evidence in the passage? A. It was built a few years before the story takes place. B. It is a modern house. C. It was built many years before the year the story takes place. Or D. Sally spent most of her childhood living in a different house. So here what we need to see here is it says, up in her bedroom window, Sally Carol Happer rested her 19-year-old chin on a 52-year-old sill. So the answer here is C. From this clue here, we can tell that the house was built, or we can infer that the house was built many years before the story actually takes place. I want to apologize in advance if you hear any purrs or mews or anything like that on the mic for the rest of the video because my cat just decided to jump up on my lap, so sorry in advance if that happens. Okay, question five. What is the setting of the story? A. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, B. Fort Lauderdale, Florida, C. Tarleton, Georgia, or D. Dallas, Texas. So you can pause the video, and I think I forgot to tell you to do that for the last question, but you can pause the video for this one now, try to figure this out, and then as always, we'll go over it. Okay, so here the setting is Tarleton in southernmost Georgia, and it's pretty much, this one comes right out of the text. This was, I put the excerpt from the passage down here, so hopefully you got that one. Um, and then question six says, which character eats the apple in the story? Please consider paragraphs seven through 12 in your answer. A, Sally or B, Clark. And so just to make it easy, I was able to fit all this up on the screen here. So I put those paragraphs up on the screen. So you can pause the video, use this information to try to answer this question. And then as always, we'll go over it.
Okay, so here for this question, you just have to kind of reason your way through it. Um, and seven, we it reads, good morning, right? And then it talks about Clark. And then in section eight or paragraph eight, it says, it ain't morning, Sally Carroll. So since it says it ain't morning, Sally Carroll here, that tells us that it's not Sally Carroll who's saying this in segment eight, it's Clark, right? And so Clark is speaking. And then we therefore know that he must be speaking to Sally. So nine must be Sally. And it goes back to Clark. And then 11 must be Sally. So the answer here is a Sally. All right. So if you made it this far into the video, congratulations. Uh, you're doing a great job by sticking with this here. Uh, we're on to the next passage now and it reads, what is influenza? Influenza is a respiratory illness, which is more commonly known as the flu. Flu symptoms typically come on quickly. Common symptoms of the flu include fever, muscle or body aches, headaches, sore throat, fatigue, and cough. Typically, the peak months for flu occur between December and February. This time period is commonly known as flu season. However, cases of flu still occur year-round. Experts state that people with flu can pass it on to other people up to approximately six feet away through by droplets produced when people cough, sneeze, or talk. When a person contracts the flu, they are most contagious in the first three to four days after their sickness begins. However, most adults may still be contagious for five to seven days. One method for detecting if someone has influenza is a rapid influenza diagnostic test, RIDT. While not as accurate as rapid molecular assays, RIDTs can provide faster results. Although slower than RIDTs, rapid molecular assays are still faster than other testing options such as transcription polymerase chain reaction, viral culture, and immunofluorescence assays, each of which require a healthcare provider to swab the back of a patient's throat or inside the patient's nose. Okay, so here we're up to question seven. And this question says, according to the passage, which one of the following is not an influenza symptom? A, muscle or body aches. B, chest pain. C, headaches. Or D, sore throat. So pause the video, refer to the passage, please, and try to figure this one out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so the answer to seven here is B. And in the second uh, section here, it says common symptoms of flu include fever, muscle or body, aches, etc., etc. So what I want you to see basically here is that uh, to get this right, you needed to find the part of the passage that listed the symptoms here and just process of elimination until you find that uh, B uh, is not one of those symptoms listed in the passage. Jared wants to travel from Jacksonville, Florida to Los Angeles, California by plane. However, he is concerned about contracting the influenza virus. Based on the information in the passage, traveling during which month will give Jared the least chance of contracting the flu? A. July B. December C. January or D. February Pause the video, try to figure this out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so a quick tip here for this question would be to think about which one of these choices is most different from the others. And hopefully what you would see then is that uh, December, January, and February are all in the winter, whereas July is in the summer. So sometimes just by looking at answer choices and thinking about uh, is there one that's different from the others, that can help cue you into the answer. Um, but that's not a strategy that's always going to work, right? You still want to get used to using the passage to find the answer. So in the passage, in the second section, right, it states clearly Typically, the peak months for flu occur between December and February. So if the peak months are between December and February, and Jared wants to book a flight at a time when he would have the lowest chance of getting the flu, you would want to do it at a time like July, where it's not one of the peak months. So I know that at least one person watching this might be thinking that it sounds like a contradiction that I'm telling you that there's a trick where you can sometimes find an answer choice that's uh, different from the others but that you still also have to reason your way through it using the passage. So let me explain what I mean. Um, it's always best to rely on the text in the passage to answer the question, not on tricks. But as a last resort, that's a trick that can sometimes work. Okay, so here's question nine. 
According to the passage, which of the following is most likely to be correct regarding how long each test takes to obtain results? Our IDTs take 10 to 15 minutes, rapid molecular assays take 15 to 20 minutes, and viral cultures take an hour or more? B. Viral cultures take 10 to 15 minutes, rapid molecular assays take 15 to 20 minutes, and RIDTs take an hour or more? Or C. Rapid molecular assays take 10 to 15 minutes, viral cultures take 15 to 20 minutes, and RIDTs take an hour or more? Or D. Rapid molecular assays take 10 to 15 minutes, RIDTs take 15 to 20 minutes, and RIDTs take an hour or more. Pause the video, try to figure this one out, try to reason your way through it, and then we'll go over it. And what you really need to see here to get this right is you have to look at section 6, where it says, although slower than RIDTs, rapid molecular assays are still faster than other testing options. All right. So from that, we have to think that rapid molecular assays, all right, they're slower than RIDTs, but they're faster than other options like the viral cultures. So therefore, answer A is the most logical choice here. Okay, question 10. According to the passage, which of the following is false? A. RIDTs are more accurate than rapid molecular assays. B. Transcription polymerase chain reactions involve a nose or throat swap. C. Rapid molecular assays are more accurate than RIDTs. Or D. RIDTs can provide results faster than rapid molecular assays. So go ahead, pause the video, try to figure it out, and then we'll go over this. So here's another trick you can sometimes use as a last resort. So remember, if it's a last resort, the time's ticking down, you have to guess. That's when you want to use these tricks. You want to always use the passage first to answer the questions. But the trick here is that you'll note that A and C are both opposite answer choices, right? They are both statements that contradict each other. They're opposites. They can't both be correct. So whenever you see two answer choices that contradict each other or they both can't be right, um, there, chances are um, one of them is going to be the right answer. And it's not always going to work. There's no guarantee, right? But that's a good strategy to if you're running out of time. Um, but let's look at the passage here. And basically what it says here is, uh, what it tells us in the passage is that in paragraph 5, um, it tells us basically that RIDTs are faster, uh, which confirms that D is correct. Because um, remember, it's asking us which of the following is false here, all right? Now also at the end of paragraph 6 where I've highlighted it for you, it's talking about the transcription polymerase reactions and it's telling us that uh, they do require a swab. So we know that B is going to be the correct answer. So my strategy here that I'm kind of teaching you here, um, there's multiple ways to go about a question like this, but the strategy would be to kind of um, go down through each answer choice, uh, see if you can confirm that they're correct in the passage. If you can confirm that it's correct, that's not going to be the right answer here because it's asking for which of the following is false. And hopefully you'll see that A is the correct answer. Okay, so please note that questions 11 through 13 are going to refer to the following two passages. So let me read the first passage first. It says, this passage is written by a concerned citizen of Minneapolis. It says, Having been a member of the urban Minneapolis community for nearly 50 years, I can say with the utmost confidence that teachers and support staff in our local community are drastically underpaid. Our city's teachers play a major role in shaping the youth in our community for years to come. Since Minnesota collected a multi-billion dollar budget surplus this year, it's time our educational support professionals earned a living wage. And this is still that concerned citizen. That's uh, This is just a continuation of the first passage. It says, The Minneapolis District's proposal of a 6.4% wage increase for teachers and an 8% wage increase for staff members barely scratches the surface. Teachers and support staff deserve, at minimum, wage increases of 20%. Since the state of Minnesota's budget surplus for the 2022-23 fiscal year is projected to be over $9 billion, there is no valid reason for the state not to boost funding so our educational professionals are no longer living paycheck to paycheck. Over 34,000 students attend the Minneapolis Public School District. These children and teens have a right to a high-quality education. When our best and brightest teachers start finding higher-paying jobs elsewhere, don't expect them to stick around. So that was the first passage. Now here's the second passage that is going to go along with questions 11 through 13. 
Now this passage is written from the perspective of a concerned farmer from rural Minnesota, and it reads, Rather than worry about traffic lights and missing the light rail, my daily woes involve livestock, poultry, and agriculture. I believe I speak for not just all of us farmers, but everyone else who lives down an old dirt road across Minnesota. We're tired of breaking our backs for a living just to see our tax dollars continually used to bail out the public schools in the city. Why we here in the rest of the state pick up the tab for the Minneapolis district? And this is the same farmer, it's just a continuation, it reads, I've heard that some people in the cities are calling for 20% or more in raises. Well, we might live out here in the sticks, but we can still do math. A 20% raise would create nearly $300 million in expenses over the next few years. The schools are already estimated to run a $21.5 million budget deficit next year, even after the government just gave them relief money. When the district can't balance a budget as it is, why should we toss more money their way? Instead, let's take some of the money from the budget surplus and redistribute it back to the farmers and the blue-collar workers. Okay, question 11. What does the farmer feel would be the best use of the money from the budget surplus? A. Raising salaries of teachers and support staff. B. Hiring more teachers. C. Redistribute it to the farmers and blue-collar workers. Or D. Use it to build new bridges in Minneapolis. Pause the video, try this, and then we'll go over it like always. Okay, so the answer here is C. Uh, the farmer wants to redistribute it to the farmers and blue-collar workers, and this comes pretty much right out of the passage here. Tommy just wandered off to go do his own studying, but it didn't last very long. Question 12. The topic of both passages is A. Whether or not public school students should have summers off. B. How automation will impact farmers. C. The best way to spend budget, the budget surplus in Minnesota. Or D. If the teachers in the Minneapolis district are effectively preparing students for standardized tests. So pause the video, please refer back to both passages as needed, and try to answer this question, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so the answer here is C. And in the first passage, remember that the author was arguing that at least some of the extra money should go to paying higher teacher salaries. Whereas in the second passage, the author was arguing that instead of spending the money on public schools, it really should be given to the farmers and the other workers. So that's why C is the correct answer. That is the topic of both passages. Question 13. The authors of the passages disagree about which of the following claims about the Minneapolis School District. A. The Minneapolis School District can afford to raise teacher and staff salaries. B. The curriculum is not sufficient for preparing students for college. C. The state of Minnesota collected a budget surplus. Or D. Education will be an important topic in the upcoming mayoral election. So you know the drill by now. Should go without saying. Pause the video. Please try to figure this out and we'll go over it. Okay, so let's get this one. Let's get this one done here. So Basically, the answer here is going to be A, and to get this one right, you'd really want to refer to uh, both of the passages, right? So remember here um, that in passage one, uh, the author is basically arguing that there's so much money in the budget surplus that there's no reason we can't afford to pay for uh, raises. And in passage two, the farmer was saying that, hey, the district already can't balance a budget as it is. Why would we trust them with more money? So the ultimate um, thing that they would disagree about is choice A. Thank you so much for watching. If you want more videos on RLA and to help you prepare, uh, please see my videos and my playlist for the RLA section. Thanks again for sticking with me here. Good luck on your test. I wish you the best of luck.